Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, the Parat Library is pleased to present local Greenwich author Stasha Healy, whose book, Secret Connecticut, A Guide to the Weird, Wonderful, and Obscure, was published earlier this year and is already in its second printing. It's an engaging book that tells 84 true, surprising stories about the state of Connecticut covering all time periods and locations. Stasha is a career travel writer and editor for publications including Condé Nast Traveler, Fodors, and Travel Agent Magazine. A longtime Greenwich resident, she is a member of the Greenwich Pen Women and the Connecticut Press Club. We welcome Stasha to our Zoom session tonight. We just want to mention one bit of housekeeping, and that is that uh, Stasha will take your questions uh, at the end at about quarter to seven. But during the uh, presentation, if you have any burning questions, feel free to enter them in the chat, and we will uh, keep track of them for the end. Welcome, Stasha. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so I'm going to give a, a very brief background to how uh, this book came to be, and then I'm going to just dive right in. So I'm a travel writer, and um, during the pandemic, the I was, uh, I'm was i a member of the Society of American Travel Writers, and there was a professional development seminar, and um, I learned about a publisher that had a bunch of, of um, series of books, and one was Secret. So secret Chicago, secret Indianapolis, secret San Diego. And they didn't have a, a secret anything to do with Connecticut. And I thought, hmm, I bet we're one of the oldest states and I, I bet we have a lot of secrets. So I pitched it and that's how this book came to be. And this was June of, of last year. And I researched it for two months and then wrote it for two months. So it came together pretty quickly as these things go. And how I researched it, I started with taking um, every book out of the library that had the word Connecticut in its title. So Connecticut icons, Connecticut gastronomy, Connecticut pirates and privateers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was, um, it was such an interesting journey and I hope you enjoy it. There are 84 stories. And so I'm obviously not gonna cover all of that, but I'm gonna do somewhat of the greatest hits. Um, what and what I mean by that is when people um, when I say, oh, did you know, blah, blah, people are like, oh, I didn't know that, like all, all across the board. So um, and I'm going to start with since this is for the prot, I'm, I'm going to start with um, two Greenwich stories. And um, this first one, here, let me share my screen. Okay, so this um, on, if everybody can see who, who this is, this is Ned Lamont, this is our governor with my book. Four days after the book was uh, released, I was at a press conference where he was and um, I handed him the book and he was uh, kind enough to pose with it. And in case you're wondering where that is, that is Aquila's Nest Vineyards in um, Newtown, Connecticut. And it's a really great place in case anybody likes wine. Okay, so where you see the arrow, this is what I'm talking about right here. And we are in Greenwich Harbor right now. And my father-in-law had um, a boat and whenever we went out, he when we went by this, bridge, he would say, oh, there's the Brooklyn Bridge. And when I was researching this book, I thought, now's an opportunity for me to actually see if there's any connection between the Brooklyn Bridge and this bridge, because obviously that is not the Brooklyn Bridge. So this is where it is, again, the arrow here. And it's um, it was a development at the turn of the last century called Field Point. And see, this is Bellhaven over here. So it's next to Bellhaven. This is Greenwich Harbor. And, um, you know, like the Indian Harbor Yacht Club is over here. So um, this is the, the area that I'm talking about. It's a private home. 
Um, so obviously you can't go visit it and can't, um, but you can see it from the water. Um, that first, this picture, I, I took this picture from um, just with my, my phone from Island Beach Ferry. Um, so the, the owner, the guy who built this, his name was George Pynchon. And yes, he's a relation of Thomas Pynchon, the writer. And he was um, a stockbroker and a champion yachtsman. And he needed a functional pier and, the mean, and he had the means to build a landmark feature. The Brooklyn Bridge was not even 20 years old when he engaged the Roeblings to build this pedestrian footbridge that you can see in the foreground. And this is um, a, a picture of, of it from the property. And um, the, the landscape architect was nice enough to give me um, this, these pictures. And so when I was researching this, I, how I found this information was I, I asked the, the, the town historian, the town librarian, um, I went to the landscape architect, I went to the, um, the realtor who sold the home, I looked at, at old um, Greenwich Time articles, there was an architectural digest story about this property, and everyone had something different to say, and it was nothing was, was, was that I could find um, supported other, the other facts. So it was this long, no, it was this long. It was built by this Roebling, no, it was built by that Roebling. So it was really hard for me to find the, the real information. And I finally did it. I researched um, and I, I, I tracked somebody down on social media um, and her name's Martha Moore and she is a, a descendant of the Roeblings. And she, um, she was, She's on the board of the trustee uh, at the Roebling Museum in Roebling, New Jersey. So there, that is such a thing. And this is what she told me. Roebling engineer Seaburn A. Cooney connected Pynchon's waterfront seawall with a stone pier, completing the 175 foot footbridge in 1903. Its walkway is four feet wide and the cables are one inch in diameter. In addition to its renowned vehicular bridges, John A. Roebling Sons Company also built pedestrian suspension bridges that are now on public land from Maine to Texas. This Greenwich Bridge is thought to be the only one on private property. And Greenwich also has another connection to the Brooklyn Bridge. Bluestone granite from the Byram Shore quarries was used in constructing it and the base of the Statue of Liberty. Now, this is another Greenwich story um, that if you follow the Greenwich Historical Society, you will know this already. But um, for those of you who don't, this is a really, really wonderful story. Have you ever wondered who has lived in your house before you? I do sometimes. Um, what happened in these walls? And we, there's one house in Greenwich where, where three very prominent um, people lived and really has a wonderful story to tell. So you're looking at a 1887 map of Greenwich with a neighborhood called Hangroot Circled. The area around Lower Round Hill Road and Horseneck Brook is marked on maps of the 1800s as colored settlement and hangroot, probably due to the practice of hanging vegetables from the ceiling root cellars. Free people of color settled there in the early 1800s and owned land and homes. And Alan Green, a free black man, purchased the land in 1839 and built his home in 1845. I just love these pictures. I feel like the one on the right is the beginning of like setting the scene for a movie. The painter John Henry Twachman, a founding member of the Cos Cobb American Impressionist Art Colony, which is headquartered at the Bush Holly House, bought the Alan Green home in 1890 and fellow painter, painters, including Theodore Robinson and Child Hassam, used his home, his children, and the surrounding landscapes as subjects. And you will, you will recognize the, the man and the frog in the next slide. Jim Hansen and his family lived in this very same house from 1964 to 1971. At the 2017 annual meeting of the Greenwich Historical Society, daughter Cheryl Hansen recalled, I love this quote, it was an ideal setting for a young family, an old home full of nooks and crannies, back stairs, an old barn, 
a place full of history and story bordered by a forest and a wonderful babbling brook. In the spring of 1969, before the first episode of Sesame Street aired, Jim treated lucky North Street Elementary School students to a performance that included Kermit and Rolf. That's Cheryl Henson on the left. I took that picture when she was setting up a dollhouse that her father built and the whole family made the furniture for it and all the, the, the they decorated it. It was just a lovely family project and she was so happy to take it out of storage and and set it up for this exhibition. And uh, it was just a really wonderful exhibition and, and Greenwich should be really proud to have this history known. Okay, this, is, now we're moving to Stanford. This, um, as many of you will know, is the Fish Church. And this is a symbol, uh, ancient symbol for Christianity called the Ichthyus. And this was the architect, Wallace Harrison. He was, as you can see from the buildings that surround him in this slide, these are buildings that he worked on. So Rockefeller Center, the UN, Radio City Musical, um, and the, the Met, Lincoln Center. So you put together a, a, a church, the symbol for Christianity is a fish and a famous architect, and you would think that the church was meant to be in the shape of the fish, but you would be wrong. So this is the secret of this church that is called fish. It's, it's the first Presbyterian church of Stanford, but it's called the fish church. Everybody calls it the fish church. That's its URL. It's the fish church. And it wasn't meant to be a fish. And I have um, a quote from Harrison. A square arrangement wouldn't do. We had to modify and remodify. Finally, we arrived at the shape of an elongated megaphone to spread the sound toward the rear. That determined the shape. The fish symbolism was discovered later. When you are finally done, people will always rationalize. These are some uh, photos from the construction. Um, he was focused on designing and engineering 20,000 stained glass pieces in 86 hues that were placed in 152 concrete panels and installed at 74 to 78 degree tilts. So it was quite a feat of engineering. His work in Dal de Verre, which is thick trunk chunks of glass set in mortar, was inspired by European cathedrals like Saint-Chapelle in Paris. The church was dedicated in 1958 and has inspired exclamations of holy mackerel ever since. And on January 14th of this year, the importance of the fish church was recognized on a national stage when it became a national historic landmark. And if you ever go, um, go on a sunny day and go into the balcony and you will have this view. It's quite a magnificent piece of engineering, very close to us in Greenwich. Now I'm going to tell the story of Martin Luther King Jr.'s time in Connecticut, which is a story that's becoming more well known. Um, and it's, it's a very important story to know and we should all be very proud in Connecticut of, of this. So the summer before um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, entered Morehouse College in Atlanta, he joined an, a Morehouse organized program that brought him to Simsbury to pick tobacco for Coleman Brothers. It was 1944 and there was a shortage of labor for work um, as, w, as World War II was uh, focusing resources elsewhere. Other historically black colleges participated in this work study program and other students who participated included Thurgood Marshall, Arthur Ashe and Mahalia Jackson. It was King's first time outside of the segregated South. Students lived in dormitories and labored in the fields from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. earning $4 a day. King was nominated by his peers to lead them in worship. He wrote to his mother, this is a quote, Sunday morning we had church in the dorm and I led it. I have to speak on a text every Sunday to 107 boys. His letters homes expressed wonder in the freedom to eat in any restaurant and sit wherever he pleased on public transportation. And in his autobiography, he, he reflected, after the summer in Connecticut, it was a bitter feeling going back to segregation. This lovely woman was 105 years old when she was interviewed um, by, uh, by Simsbury High School students for a documentary on Martin Luther King Jr.'s time in Connecticut. She was 
um, she was the wife of the choir director at First Church in Simsbury, and she remembered Martin Luther King Jr. singing in the choir. Um, later on his application to Crozier Theological Seminary, he wrote how he came to pursue the ministry, and I quote, the decision came about in the summer of 1944 when I felt an inescapable urge to serve society. In short, I felt a sense of responsibility which I could not escape. And King came back to Simsbury in 1947 for the same program, and these two formative summers opened his eyes and helped set him on his path. And this past January, the Martin Luther King Jr. in Connecticut Memorial was unveiled at the Simsbury Free Library. And it's just out in front and you can just park and go see it. It's, and it tells the story, so hopefully we'll never lose that story again. Now we have a couple of firsts. So you look at this picture and he kind of looks like George Washington, but it's not George Washington, it's Samuel Huntington, but he has some relationship to George Washington, which is Samuel Huntington is technically considered the first president of the United States. How is that, Stasha? Okay, I will tell you. He was president of the Continental Congress when the first document outlining the country's organization was ratified by all 13 colonies in 1781. This is where the founders first officially named the country the United States of America, and the United States Constitution replaced the Articles of Confederation on March 4, 1789, and George Washington became president a month later. So he was born in Wyndham, which is now Scotland, Connecticut. Yes, there is a Scotland, Connecticut. Huntington was a self-taught lawyer who had a career that included being Chief Justice of the Connecticut Superior Court before he headed to Philadelphia, first as a delegate, then as president of the Continental Congress. He served as Connecticut governor from 1786 to his death in 1796. A National Historic Landmark, the Samuel Huntington Homestead is open to the public on a limited schedule. This is another first that is somewhat controversial. Born in Germany as Gustav Weisskopf, this gentleman became Bridgeport resident Gustav Whitehead, and he worked in the nascent field of aviation around the turn of the last century. He professionally built uh, and engineered gliders, tested kites used in meteorological measurements and aerial photography, and he was a chief engineer of America's first aviation organization, all while, while building his own flying crafts. And at dawn on August 14, 1901, in Fairfield, he unfolded the wings of his 21st attempt at a manned aircraft and flew approximately a mile at an elevation of 50 feet. Two years later, the Wright brothers claimed the first flight. There has been much controversy about the first in flight title, but recent research that includes newly digitized newspaper archives has uncovered many previously unknown sources that confirm Whitehead's claim. The Bridgeport Herald was the original known documented source and the writer accompanied Whitehead on the flight. When the Australian historian John Brown was hired to research an aviation documentary for the Smithsonian Channel, his research revealed more than 250 previously unknown newspaper articles about Whitehead's aircrafts and flights, and many were front page items. North Carolina and Ohio refute Whitehead's claim, as does the Smithsonian, which is under legal obligation to support the rights. But in 2013, the Connecticut General Assembly and the governor recognized Whitehead as, as the first to pilot and these words are important. The first to pilot a manned, powered, heavier than air aircraft on a controlled, sustained flight. Whitehead is definitely more of a sensation in Germany. There's a museum dedicated to him in his hometown of Leitershausen, a postal seal, and even a musical that drew 13,000 people. Here's another character. I love this guy. This is Hiram Bingham III, and he was the son of missionaries, but he married an heir to the Tiffany fortune in 1900 and was therefore free economically to do what he pleased. And as an aside, the Tiffany's have a connection to Connecticut. Charles Lewis Tiffany, the man behind the little blue box was from Killingly and his son, Lewis Comfort Tiffany, renowned for his work in stained glass was raised in New York city, but spent a lot of time in Connecticut with his family. And he left a lot of windows around the state that you can see. Anyway, back to Bingham. 
Uh, he self-financed expeditions to Venezuela and Colombia, and after earning a PhD in South American history from Harvard, became the only professor in that subject at Yale. But this is what he's best known for. Um, this is him here, almost swallowed by the jungle. And this, of course, is Machu Picchu. On a 1911 expedition to Peru, deep in the jungle of a steep mountain pass, he found Machu Picchu after paying a local the equivalent of 50 cents to lead him to Incan ruins. He became an international celebrity and the April 1913 issue of National Geographic was completely devoted to his discovery and included 10,000 of his words and 250 of his photos. And these two photos here are his photos. He later wrote a bestseller, Lost City of the Incas, which became the basis for the Charlton Heston movie, Secret of the Incas, which itself inspired the character of Indiana Jones down to Indy's fedora and flight jacket. So Connecticut has a relation to Indiana Jones. Bingham did not go on to other archeological adventures, but his life continued to be less than dull. He learned to fly and pursued aviation in the military during World War I. And as all of that wasn't enough, he had a whole career in politics and served as governor for just one day. On January 7th, 1925, he woke up as Lieutenant Governor, was sworn in as governor and attended his inauguration ball. Then he re resigned to pursue a Senate seat that had suddenly been vacated. And he served as United States Senator until 1933, pulling the very indie like stunt of landing a blimp on the steps of the Capitol building when he was running late for a vote. The train that runs from Cusco to Machu Picchu is shown here, and it is called the Hiram Bingham. Uh, now on to something modern day that you can go visit. So we have here a large metal fish hanging from a tree, a bulldozer sitting on its rear end, sunflowers look down 15 feet from a basketball player sized stainless steel vase. It's a bamboo thicket, an enormous plastic swan, what looks like giant slinky, um, an Airstream trailer dangling 31 feet overhead, and lots of stone monoliths. And this is what stumped the governor. He looked at, he looked at the book when I handed it to him and he said, that looks like Stonehenge. And I said, yes, there is a Stonehenge in Woodbury. And he did not know this. This is called Hogpen Hill Farms. And it's, it's somebody's private home and private sculpture garden. Um, and he is the sculptor. His name is Edward Tuft, but he opens it to the public um, every so often. And it is $80 to go. So it's not cheap, but it's that's per car load. So if there are four people, you know, let's say four or five people in a car, it can make it worth it. And you can bring your own um, picnic. I had a lovely day there with my family. That's my daughter doing a handstand and uh, just a lot of, it's 234 acres to roam around, five miles of woods, and it was a beautiful day. And yes, so Connecticut does have a Stonehenge, and that's how you can um, uh, reserve if you are interested. And something else that people don't know about is we have our own safari park, and it is in Goshen. It's called Action Wildlife Center. You can drive around a trail and pull over to get close up looks at American bison, African Watusi cattle, and uh, zebras. And there's also a natural history museum on the premises with taxidermied creatures, including a rhinoceros and a grizzly bear, all which owner Jim Mazzarelli, pictured here, personally hunted. One of the animals is a snow leopard, which is endangered, but don't call the Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's actually a mountain lion in disguise, he explained to me. Now this, I assume um, most people on this call have read The Great Gatsby or at least um, been, uh, has seen one of the, the movies. So you know the story. And many of us have probably also been to the Inn at Longshore in Westport. And how are they connected? I will tell you. So um, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda had their honeymoon in this house with the orange door, which is right next door to, to Longshore Park in Westport. Believe it or not, all the places in the world they could go. Um, but next to the, what is now the inn at Longshore was the private home of this gentleman. He was a mysterious 
millionaire called, um, uh, let me find his name here, is Frederick Lewis. And he inherited the equivalent of $240 million on his 21st birthday. He flew planes, skippered yachts, drove race cars, and had stables full of Arabian horses. Of course he did. This is a picture of one of his actual parties. And it looks like it's a still from one of the, the Gatsby movies. Um, his parties were spectacles, and one of them was reported to have 800 cars pull up. And there was Harry Houdini, he put on a show, a full circus, and um, John Philip Sousa even wrote music for it. So he was not shy in the party department. The Fitzgeralds could see across the bay where another grand estate had a lawn that rolled to a beach and a long dock with a green light. Barbara Probst Solomon grew up in that estate and wrote a 1996 New Yorker article connecting the dots to Westport and the Fitzgeralds. But it went largely unrecognized until two Westport residents took up the cause, spending years researching a book and producing a documentary that provided strong evidence that Westport is the setting for both the Fitzgeralds' writings. And you can literally walk in their footsteps on a longshore walking tour organized through the Westport Historical Society, which I did, and it was wonderful. And um, this is Beth Zelda on the bottom there in Westport. And this is an aerial photo from, from that time. It was 175 acre estate there. Now we're on to America's smallest Native American reservation is actually in Connecticut. So we in Connecticut know about um, the, the Pequots and the Mashantucket Pequots and the Mohegans because of the casinos. But what we don't know, uh, many of us, are the Golden Hill Pogasets. For thousands of years, the tribe lived along the coast in the area that's now Bridgeport, Milford, Stratford, and Fairfield. And first Dutch traders, then English settlers arrived and relegated the tribe to reservations beginning as early as 1639 in Golden Hill, which is an area of Bridgeport. White settlers repeatedly granted and divested the pogasets of land. Oops. Oh. Um, and in 1875, a Pogaset chief uh, named William Sherman um, saved enough money to secure land with an ancient burial ground, and he built a home on it, and upon his death, deeded it to the state for use in perpetuity as the Golden Hill Reservation. This quarter of an acre is also the home of its chieftain and headquarters of the tribe. So that's in Trumbull, and it's just a home on a quarter of an acre, and that is America's smallest Native American reservation. And because of the time of year it is, I thought I would throw this into this talk. Um, the Witch's Dungeon is, um, it's a Witch's Dungeon Classic Movie Museum. It's in Plainville and it's America's longest running Halloween attraction. There are costumes, props, memorabilia from classic monster movies, um, including uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, House of Wax, Dracula, there are 22 life-size figures, Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney, Vincent Price, and others from the golden age of horror and sci-fi um, cinema, complete with organ music. And if you are going to go, I would recommend that you go early, even before it opens, because um, the line, it's not a huge museum and the lines can be long, so I would get there before it opens. Um, it's fun, especially if you're a movie buff. And I'm going to end with a vocabulary lesson. Uh, as a writer, I love words, and I was really happy to learn these two words, troberitz and joggleress. A troberitz is a female troubadour, and a joggleress is a lower class troberitz. Why am I discussing this? Because Connecticut employs a troberitz. Yes. In 1991, the Connecticut General Assembly voted in favor of hiring a state troubadour. The singer-songwriter in the role receives an annual stipend and performs around the state. There have been 17 state troubadours, including the current one, Nikita Waller, who is technically a troubaritz. And thank you, that's the end. I'm happy to take questions and comments. Um, and I have a, a website where I have a monthly email newsletter about things that are going on in Connecticut. 
And um, you can buy my book at um, the, the museum store of the Greenwich Historical Society, um, at Barnes and Noble, at Amazon, wherever books are sold. And I also sell them on my website. So thank you very much. Wonderful presentation, uh, Stasha. Thank you so much. We do have a few comments in the chat. Uh, I don't know if, if you were able to see them during your presentation. Um, Pat Cleese mentioned that the Roebling Bridge looks like a smile uh, when lit up at night. Oh, I've never seen it at night, actually. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Oh, yeah, I see somebody. Uh, yeah, we'll, like we'll skip that. Um, uh, then Pat also mentioned that the state troubadour has performed at the Byron Schubert. Oh, Festival. that's so cool. And Diane Morello asked uh, Stasha, have you uncovered any new secrets in Connecticut since you published the book? I do ask when I'm going around speaking if anybody has anything to share. And um, uh, a few people have um, have shared some information, um, and also I I recently went. I, I don't really know how much of a secret this is, but um, the longest running ferry in in North America is is in uh, Rocky Hill, and uh, I came upon it when I was taking my kids to the the, the dinosaur um, exhibit in Rocky Hill. And I was looking for a place for lunch, and there's a place called the the ferry, the ferry something, um, and and it's right at at the ferry landing where this ferry just goes back and forth across the river, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And there's a historical sign. So I was really interested to to find that out. It's something like two hundred and I think it was, I think it was uh, sixteen something 16 something that it started and that it's just been going back and forth constantly and i i found that very interesting and that, that wasn't in the book um what else somebody told me that um around windsor there is oh no not windsor granby granby that there is um a bed and breakfast that is all japanese um themed so with tatami mats and and you're served japanese food and um it's it's a japanese um intaker and so um, innkeeper. And so I, that was interesting to me. I have not um, pursued that lead. So those were a couple of things that people told me. Um, I'm happy to, to know any, um, any, any tips, leads that anybody on this call has that um, I can pursue. And I, like I said, I do um, do a monthly newsletter and I could pursue it and, and write it up. Don't be shy. If you'd like to um, ask uh, Stasha a question, now's your time. Um, you can uh, unmute yourself uh, or raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can speak. Um, excuse me, I don't have. I'm always learning things though. I'm a lifelong learner and it's been really fun for me to, to research and find out all this information. Um, I, I recently saw a documentary about Balanchine and that made me remember that in my research about the Wadsworth Athenaeum, that the former director of the Wadsworth, um, Chick, I um, can't remember what his last name is, um, but he was such a patron of the arts and he um, found that there was, uh, that he, he invited George Balanchine over to the States to begin with. He, Balanchine wasn't supposed to go to New York City to begin with, he was supposed to go to Hartford, but he was only in Hartford for a couple of weeks or, or a month. It was a very short period of time. And then he got seduced by, by New York City and ended up um, founding his ballet school and ballet company there. Um, but we had him for a short period of time. So that was very interesting for, for me to learn too. Some, uh, Victoria is asking, um, why is Connecticut called the nutmeg state? That sounds like a library question. <laughs> um, well, at the founding of uh, when our country was new, spices were hard to come by and, um, and nutmeg was actually never grown here, but I guess we used a lot of nutmeg back in the day. 
Um, Nancy Lamazo comments that the food stand at the ferry uh, is Ferry Park Grill. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, that's it. Yeah, and the food was pretty good. And they had a really, really long menu, which surprised me for a very small food shack. Um, and it was, you know, I wouldn't say it's like the best food I've ever had, but it was, it was perfectly pleasant and it was a beautiful location. So um, I, I recommend it. Cool. Um, and Jessica Wasaki says there used to be a lot of fake money in Connecticut made of nutmeg. And we became known for that. Interesting. So that I don't know how one can make money out of nutmeg, but I guess people figured it out. I guess so. <laughs> That's interesting. I wondered uh, the small reservation that you um, mentioned. Is it? Can you visit it? I noticed it had a private property sign. No, um, no, it's it's private. Yeah. It okay. Okay. Um, As a, an aside to that story. Um, in 1981, I believe the the Pogasets were um, were granted more land from from the state in Colchester, which is an hour and a half away from Trumbull. So there is a larger Pogaset reservation in Colchester, but um, it's 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 not you know in in Trumbull, They're not together. So. Um, someone, yeah. uh, oh, Jessica's saying perhaps they were nutmeg coins uh, in similar to wooden nickels. <laughs> and she included, uh, Reagan Avery has included a link um, oh, cool. uh, about why early America was obsessed with nutmegs. So you can see that in the chat. Um, uh, and Nancy Lamazo says fake nutmegs carved from wood and sold as expensive real nutmeg. Um, ah, the old Victoria, Victoria mentions that there are many famous hiking trails in Connecticut. Uh, yes, that's not something I, I covered in, in the book. And what is the name of the newsletter, um, uh, Stasha, that you uh, that you write that you uh, it's it's just called secret connecticut and i've started i started it in july um cool. and it's it's really fun so i i just whatever has come across my um my um my inbox i i like recently i one of the stories in the book is about sergeant stubby he was this uh little dog um who was the the first it, this was in world war one and he was a stray and he happened upon um, uh, a, a battalion training in New, in New Haven and they befriended each other and um, they, they had him, they taught him how to salute the little dog and, and they took him um, on overseas to, to France. And he wasn't supposed to be um, with, the, with them, but when, when the commanding officer saw him um, salute, they, he let him stay. And then he ended up serving in 17 battles. And anyway, I had this whole story about this, this wonderful little dog. And um, I didn't know that there was an animated movie about him and I recently came across it. And so that's an example of something that I put in my newsletter um, about how to find this movie. And it has Gerard de Perdue as one of the voices and Helena Bonham Carter. Um, it's, it's a really sweet movie that, that tells the story of this dog that became ridiculously famous. I wondered if you had any stories related to the Civil War in your book, um, because I know that Connecticut has a rich uh, Civil War uh, history, and indeed a, a, a cemetery in Darien. The, the story that comes to mind that mentions the Civil War um, is that of Little Liberia, which is a neighborhood in um, Bridgeport, where uh, the Freeman houses are, and those are um, houses of two sisters, Mary and Eliza Freeman, and they are the, the oldest homes that were owned by African Americans in the state of Connecticut, and um, they, you can't visit them um, because they're in a state of disrepair, and um, people are working on fundraising to um, bring them back to life, but they were part of a community um, that, again, I would love to see a movie about this um, about this uh, place. 
at, at this time. So this, while slavery was, was still uh, legal, there was this wonderful um, active community of uh, people of color. They were uh, black and um, natives, Native Americans. And, um, and there, there was a, a four story hotel. There was, um, there were, you know, libraries and schools and um, people worked on, on ships. Um, and and uh, Mary Freeman was the, the most wealthy person in Bridgeport um, after P.T. Barnum. So that's really saying something. She invested in real estate. And, um, and so this is a story that, again, that, that people should know about. And, um, and the Freemans, uh, this, this whole community, there, there were people who, in this community who, who served um, in the Civil War. Hmm. Interesting. Right. Very interesting. Anyone else have any questions or comments for Stasha? Don't be shy. You can always use the chat if you prefer not to uh, speak on camera. We always seem to have the you know, people are uh, shy to speak up. <laughs> we always seem to have this uh, this issue. Stasha, it's it's Jess here. And um, I was wondering if you, we had talked a little bit earlier about um, the Warrens who I happen to know about, but considering um, we're, we're a Halloween's upon us, you wanna talk a little bit about what you maybe um, found? I don't know if anybody knows that those are like famous ghost hunters in our, from our state. Um, yes, but... so, so the story <laughs> in my book about them is titled, Who Are You Gonna Call? And because <laughs> that they were ghostbusters, um, uh, it was Ed and Lorraine Warren. They were mar a married couple. Uh, they're now deceased, and their um, son-in-law has taken up the um, the charge of of investigating the paranormal. But they investigated ten thousand different stories of reports of paranormal activity, and um, they didn't charge their um, their clients. They got money from film rights. So films like Amityville Horror and Annabelle and um, The Conjuring were all based on stories that, that they investigated. And they were in Monroe and they had a um, occult museum with objects that they accumulated through, um, through their investigations and it's no longer um, available to visit. But yes, very, very interesting stories there. Uh, uh, website so yeah someone asked about now is if someone's interested in subscribing to your newsletter can they do that through your stasha Mills yeah okay. stasha mills .com. Dot com. cool yeah so i have about 225 people on the email list um and i'd love for more tell your friends um i don't sell i don't sell information i don't you know it's just once a month you'll hear from me um and it's, it's a very short email newsletter. So it's just things that I learned that pertain to the book or to Connecticut. And I'm happy to, to take tips and you can um, always, my email address is on my website too. It's just Stasha Healy at Gmail. So um, anybody who has anything they wanna share um, or any questions, et cetera, um, can contact me afterwards as well. We also have a question from Kathy McCormick uh, asking, are you working on a new book? Um, I. I am working on a young adult novel, actually. So it's something completely different, but um, it's based on my own personal um, experience and it's an anti-bullying um, book. And um, I hope to bring it to fruition at some point. It is, it is finished, um, but there's always a process of um, trying to find the right fit in, in a publisher. And um, I've been, a little um, preoccupied with, with this book, which very happily so, but I do hope to get back to finding um, an, an outlet for this young adult novel because I think it's a very important topic and it, it needs to be addressed. Cool. Yes, uh, Je Jessica says, sounds like a neat book, good topic. Um, 
Thank well, you. We'll certainly be interested in getting a copy for the Parat Library and, and having you back for a, uh, another book discussion. Um, Thank you. And, uh, sounds very interesting. Anybody else before we go? Any other questions? Very interesting. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Stash. It was wonderful, very informative, and uh, we look forward, as, as I said, to your next book. <laughs> Thank and you. Thank you for having me. For all of you, uh, the recording of this, um, of Sasha's presentation uh, will be available uh, uh, on our website um, and on social media, um, if not tomorrow, then the next day, but shortly for any of your friends who may have missed it. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye.